And welcome to Noon Conferences, hosted by MRI Online. In response to the changes happening around the world right now and the shutting down of in-person events, we have decided to provide free daily Noon Conferences to all radiologists worldwide. Today, we're joined by Dr. Carolyn D. Benedictus. She is an Associate Professor of Radiology for the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In addition, she has the roles of Vice Chair of Port Education and Radiology Residency Program Director. A reminder, there will be time at the end of this hour for a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A feature to ask all of your questions, and we'll get to as many as we can before our time is up. That being said, thanks so much for joining us today, Dr. D. Benedictus. I will let you take it from here. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So if everyone can see that. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about breast intervention. Um, I have no disclosures. So I think it's important to know the history of breast biopsies in order to fully understand why we have some of the techniques we have. So originally surgeons Oh, that when they were unable to palpate a lesion that was detected on mammogram, they really had no way of moving it, removing it um, precisely. So they had to remove large amounts of tissues to get the pathologic diagnosis. And a lot of the times these pathologic conditions were benign. And so these women had large surgical deformities that were kind of unnecessary. So it, it led radiologists and surgeons to find a new way to do this. And the first image guided intervention to aid in breast biopsy was needle localization. The patient still required surgery and still required anesthesia, but we could use imaging to place the wire into the mammographic finding and allow them to remove significantly less breast tissue. So this was the first way that we were able to use image guidance to do um, a less invasive intervention. Um, when needle, needle localizations were the initial diagnosis for a while, but then they were replaced by fine needle aspiration and eventually by core biopsy. So why do we need histologic diagnosis? Despite mammography's ability to detect lesions in the breast, there's a great overlap in the imaging appearance of benign and malignant lesions. Because of this, we need cytology or histology to diagnose the definitive diagnosis as being benign or malignant. One concern people have with percutaneous biopsies is when we used to do surgical biopsies, we'd have the whole lesion to look at. And so, you could see the entire lesion. You didn't worry about what if you got a spot, you know, that was benign in this lesion and there's also a cancer there. Um, so we really worried about that. So we wanted to look at the positive predictive value of breast biopsies. So the positive predictive value is the number of examinations it takes to find cancers that were found. And the positive predictive value of mammography, uh, the positive predictive value for mammographically detected lesions increases with patients by age. It's 10 to 15% at age 40 and up to 50% at age 79. So the older you are, the more likely a lesion detected on mammography is going to be a cancer. And the goal is to increase the positive predictive values of biopsies and to have less benign biopsies. And we want to do this because we don't want to, but we want to do this so that we don't have too many false positives, but we also want to make sure we're not missing cancers. So we're always going to have some false positives um, because we don't want to miss cancers. So sensitivity is the number of cancers ultimately diagnosed in a screening program. And for most screening programs um, that screen the average population of women ages 40 to 80, they'll detect six to 10 cancers per 1,000 women screened. And of the cancers detected by screening mammography, 30% are DCIS, 50% are invasive ductal carcinoma less than one centimeter and less than 20% have positive lymph nodes. So what you wanna learn from these stats is that screening works that if the, the majority of patients who get screened, roughly 80% will have a stage one or less breast cancer, um, which is not true for the population that isn't screened, where 75% of deaths that occur in breast cancer patients are in the population that is not regularly screened. So of all biopsies, about 20% of biopsies you perform in an imaging center are positive for malignancy, but that means 80% are benign. And that's a useful statistic to know when you go into talk to a patient who needs a biopsy. The important thing for them to know is most of the biopsies we do are benign, but we also have to catch those malignancies, those 20% of malignancies, because those patients, 80% of those patients who are diagnosed off imaging have early stage cancer. So needle versus surgical biopsies. So image-guided core biopsies has become the standard diagnostic technique for all breast lesions. Core needle biopsy has been shown to be very accurate. However, there's always a problem of sampling error. However, it's, it's typically pretty low. And why does this happen? It's because needles can't remove the entire lesion. 
And a design result can actually be a result of missing the cancer with sampling technique. And that's why we usually document images of our needle directly through the lesion. And also we can um, do orthogonal views to show in two planes that our, our needle is through the lesion. And this is why, because of this sampling error and this small risk of sampling error, that when we get high risk lesions like ADH and um, papillomas and complex sclerosing lesions, we do a surgical excision. And this is to exclude the possibility of sampling error in that we just got the edge where there's ADH, but it's really a lesion of DCIS. And so that's why with these higher risk lesions, we do surgical excision. Of course, open surgical biopsy remains the gold standard of pathology because you're examining the entire lesion. But that being said, the most common way we do biopsies is by core needle right now. So how can we reduce sampling error? So it was really important, as I said, to use imaging well to confirm that the placement of the needle is in the center of the lesion and to confirm that you've used different, uh, you've sampled different parts of the lesion. Again, the bigger the bore of the core needle device, or if you use vacuum assisted devices, um, the false the false positive, uh, the false negative rate actually decreases. So you can reduce your sampling error with a larger bore needle and using vacuum assistance. Of course, the problem with larger bore needles is you can get more bleeding. So what are the benefits of corneal biopsy over surgery? Well, clearly it's less invasive. There's fewer complications. Specifically, there's less complications from anesthesia um, because corneal biopsies require only local, not general anesthesia. And there's smaller to no scars from corneal biopsies. So these are definitely the benefits. So sometimes you still need a surgical excision after core needle biopsy, and why would this be? Well, we talked about if it's a high-risk lesion. That's one reason. But the other reason is we have to make sure that the pathology results are concordant with the imaging. If they're not concordant with the pathology, so if we see a speculated mass on imaging and it comes back fibrocystic tissue, that worries us because we thought that should have been a cancer. So in this case, we would recommend surgical excision to rule out sampling error. And it's always important to review all of your imaging in light of the pathology and to attend your biopsy reports with regard to concordance. And anytime there's a question of concordance, you should always defer to surgical excision, which is the gold standard. So we talked a little about corneal biopsy, but we also had talked about between when we started doing surgical excisions and localizations to corneal biopsies, there was fine needle aspirations. And so for a while, this is what people used. And this involves using a fine needle, which is usually 21 to 25 gauge, and putting it into a lesion with active suction um, in an effort to aspirate the cells. FNA is very successful because breast cancer cells tend to be less cohesive and break off more easily than normal tissue. And as cytology is advanced, we can even get receptors from this now. Way back when, cytology methods were not as advanced and we weren't able to get receptors, but now we can even get receptors, most receptors off of an uh, FNA. And it's very, very sensitive for malignant cells. Um, and now even, it, it can even tell us something about type and grade, but not as much as a corneal biopsy. And that's why we always now default that we have the technology to corneal biopsy. However, there's still lesions that we can't get by corneal biopsy because they're close to an implant, close to the chest wall, all sorts of reasons. So you can still use fine needle aspiration on masses that are not amenable to corneal biopsy. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of fine needle aspiration? Well, again, we talked about it's virtually atraumatic. You're using a really small bore needle. It's very simple to perform, and a cytologist can actually interpret it immediately. You can have on-site cytopath, whereas when you do a core needle biopsy, it requires at least 48 hours of fixation and staining before a pathologist can review it. The disadvantages are it's very skill-dependent, not only on the person doing procedure, but the cytologist in, who's interpreting it. Um, again, we can't get all the information we really like to get about cancers from uh, FNA. So again, we'll go back to core needle biopsy, which is now our, our standard of care for initial uh, sampling of lesions in the breast. And it involves removal of actual intact pieces of tissue that can be analyzed histologically. And this is why it's better than an FNA for getting the full information about the tissue you're sampling, because we're getting an actual core of tissue instead of just a few cells. Core, core biopsy devices range anywhere from, from nine gauge to 18 gauge. Um, and the most commonly one, at least we use where I am, is a 14 gauge. And the nice thing is it leaves the skin intact without need for suturing unlike a excisional biopsy where you end up having sutures and scarring. 
So advantages, um, pathologists need no specialized training to interpret the sample, whereas a cytologist has additional training above a pathologist. It's less traumatic than surgical excision, and it's relatively inexpensive to perform. Disadvantages, again, like we talked about, there is the risk of sampling error. And again, the larger the bore device you use, the less sampling error there is. However, then you can get more complications. So it's a real balance of using a bore that gets us adequate sampling without too many complications, such as um, hemorrhage and infection. So which lesions do we biopsy and how? So any lesion with an imaging appearance that's associated with a greater than 2% risk of malignancy goes to biopsy, right? So anything with a less than 2% risk of malignancy by appearance is traditionally a BIRAD3, which is a probably benign finding, and we follow it. But once we've reached that 2% risk marked by morphology, that's when you'd bring them to corneal biopsy. And you want to choose a biopsy technique where you can see the image the best. Uh, see the lesion the best. So if the best place you could see it was on ultrasound, you want to biopsy it on ultrasound. If the best place you can see it is under mammography, you're going to biopsy it under mammography, MR, etc. So what are the types of image-guided corneal biopsies we do? So we do stereotactic or mammographic-guided biopsies. We do MR-guided biopsies. We do ultrasound-guided biopsies. And we also do 3D stereotactic biopsies. So what's a regular mammographic stereotactic biopsy? So what this is, is it's a mammographic guided biopsy and it involves the patient laying on a table with their breast hanging through a hole. And underneath this table is a mammogram machine essentially. And the breast, if you can see with my arrow, this is the detector here and the breast is against the detector in compression and we have a camera here. The nice part of this is that the patient can't see the needle. So this is really great for patients who are afraid of needles. Um, however, it's not great for patients with limited mobility because, as you can see, they have to get up on this table and lie on their back. Patients with spinal fusions, especially cervical spinal fusions, can have a real difficult time with this. However, we can do upright stereo biopsies as well as 3D stereo biopsies as well. So, again, at our institution, we use a low rad prone stereotactic biopsy tables. There's many different um, iterations of this. We also have upright machines that can easily be attached to hologic units or other units. Um, the patient lies prone on the table, as I said, with the breast through a hole, and, and we put the breast in compression to hold it still. So how do you pick an approach for a stereotactic biopsy? So you want to come from the shortest distance from the skin. So it's important to look at the mammographic views, the CC and the MLO, and see where the shortest distance to the skin is. Once you make that decision, you now need to look at the orthogonal view on which you'll be viewing these, the lesion to see if you can see it. So if you're gonna come from, if you decide you're gonna come from below, that means you're gonna be looking at the CC view. So you wanna look at the CC view, and if it's hard to see those calcifications on the CC view, that's not the smartest distance, even though it's the, the shortest the direction, even though it's the shortest distance, it's not the smartest because you can't biopsy what you can't see. So visualization always trumps the shortest distance, but you want to start off aiming to use the shortest distance if the visualization is okay in that approach. So we do a lot of pre-procedure imaging once the patient's in compression. We have scout views, and this is to find the target. And so the goal is to have the target centered in the window, and you want to check to see if there's any vessels, large vessels by, um, you want to make sure you can see it well, and that it's centered. If you have a lot of trouble, if you have trouble finding it, another way you can do it is you can actually use the mammogra a regular mammo machine to help you. You can get the lesion, calcification, or mass, or whatever it may be, visualize under mammo, and put a BB on it to help lo localize it, and then go back to the stereo room. If you can't find the target, you usually will cancel the biopsy. You don't want to clearly try to biopsy something you can't see, nor can you biopsy something you can't see. So what happens when we cancel biopsies? Well, there's two, there's two options. Usually, if we've gotten to the point where we want to biopsy, our suspicion of malignancy is enough that we'll recommend excision. However, if you think the suspicion of malignancy is pretty close to 2% or, or there or very low in general, you can do a six-month follow-up. So let's assume that we can see our target which is great. So now, once we've had our scout image where we can see our target, now we have to do what we call a stereo pair. And what this is, is we take two images 15 degrees apart in the opposite direction from, from midline. And this allows us to get the data so that the computer system can calculate the coordinates. 
So once we get the stereo pair, we target the images on, we target on the images and we get the X, Y, and Z coordinates. Then we check the coordinates to make sure the actual biopsy is feasible. So some things we want to look at here is um, we have a, a notch at the top. And there's a notch over to this side, um, which is to the left of the screen, in which case we want to make sure that we see where that is so that when we need to move the calcifications, like here, we want to move them into the center, we know this is the lateral breast. And so we want to move it that way. So very important. From there, we want to get the scout image. Once we get our scout image up here, we take the stereo pair, which is 15 degrees in each direction. And then we want to take a picture of the needle just anterior to the calcification before we fire it where the notch will open. And we want the tip of the needle to be at the calcifications for the pre-fire images. And we want the calcifications to be within the trough or the opening on the post images. And you can see here, this is the ideal positioning. So there's coordinates. There's the X, which is the horizontal plane, the Y, which is the vertical plane. And when you set the coordinates, the, at least in my practice, the technologist will zero the machine and then target the machine. These are set for you. So I normally, if everything's going well with a biopsy, I won't touch my X and Y coordinates. Z is the depth. Now the depth, the radiologist controls. That's the needle going into the skin. And it's important when you see the Z before you do any of your biopsy, to make sure, depending on your machine, the machine I use, that there's seven millimeters, uh, a seven millimeter stroke margin, because our, when we fire the needle or open the trough, it will go seven meter, millimeters forward. And we wanna make sure that our compression is within seven millimeters of our Z so we don't go through the other side of the breast. Again, this is device dependent and you always wanna check with your um, institution what your stroke margin is on your machine. You also want to check the coordinates because sometimes you'll look and it, you'd be firing outside of the skin, which means the lesion is too superficial. You can adjust the coordinates for this, or you can use a half trough where they close half the trough or some systems use something called a petite needle, which has a smaller trough. And you want to make sure you're not sampling the skin because that can cause healing issues if you sample the skin. So as you can see here, you'll, this is one of the views you'll have when you've gotten your coordinates. And the compression is usually above, and our compression is 42. So we want to make sure the Z is at least 7 millimeters less than the compression. And here the Z is 14.1, and our compression is 42, so we're fine. We have no issues here, and we can safely do our procedure. This is a great example from uh, Copan's book of stroke margin um, and what it is. So you can see a good stroke margin means that when you fire the needle, the lesion is in the trough and the needle is still within the other side of the breast. An insufficient stroke margin, if you fired, the needle would go through the other side of their breast. And it's, it's poor form. Of course, no one's going to die from it, but you know, you really don't want to do it. It'll cause the patient a lot of pain. Now there'll be another site that needs to heal. So, so you really don't want to do this. So stereotactic biopsy devices, the one we use at our institution is a 10-gauge vacuum-assisted biopsy device by Soros. There's one, there's a Soros Solera or a Bars Center X that we've used. There's also a 9-gauge Mamatome, which isn't used as much anymore, but some places still use. And it allows you to sample with vacuum. So what will happen is the trough will open, suction will happen via the vacuum, and it will suck the tissue in. Once the tissue is sucked in, a cutting device comes over and cuts the sample and it shoots back into the specimen uh, collection area. You can use a regular setting or a dense. So on my machine that I use, our regular setting allows for seven millimeters of suction. Our dense setting allows for 14 millimeters of suction. So if the breast is very dense, um, you can use the dense setting, but I also do it if I'm having real trouble getting close to the lesion. Of course, you wanna get as close to the calcifications of the asymmetry as you can, but sometimes due to coordinates and the body habitus and things, you can't. So the dense setting can also help you out with that. Um, and then we place a micromarker through the device at the end, which is really important because that'll allow us to mark the area um, safely if we ever need to find it again, because sometimes you do take out the entire um, lesion, calcifications or asymmetry. So when we 
numb for um, a stereotactic biopsy, you have to do a skin wheel at a funny angle. So I will usually bend the lidocaine needle to about a 45 degree angle as shown here so that I can easily make a nice skin wheel so the patient doesn't feel anything. This is just a nice image of a stereotactic biopsy where we have the calcifications within the trough. The needle rotates, some needles rotate on their own, other, needle, other needles you rotate manually so that you're gonna sample 360 degrees. Um, usually about six samples, we use a clock. Um, so usually they do the evens 12 to four. And then after you place the clip, you'll see this image. So what happens, you put the clip introducer into the um, needle and you'll deploy the clip and then you'll rotate the biopsy device 180 degrees. So as you can see here, the trough is inferior and the clip is superior because what you don't want to happen is when you pull the needle out, the clip to get stuck back in the trough and get pulled out again. So if the, if the trough is upside down or 180 degrees rotated, you, you prevent this from happening. So I always joke with my residents that stereotactic biopsies are pretty easy. It's kind of like a dance and memorizing the steps. Um, and so when stereotactic biopsies are, go well, they are really easy. Um, and I'd say 95 to 98% of the time, they're really easy. It's just memorizing the steps, you know, making sure you're checking everything. Um, but when, when things go wrong in stereo or there's an issue, stereos are really, really, really hard. So um, sometimes the breast is too thin. And in that case, you have trouble with your stroke margin. And so there are ways you can help this. Um, you, can, you can use bolsters made from foam or towels or other materials to give the breast a bulge. You can also tape and wrap around the breast near the chest wall to push tissue anterior. And sometimes that will work. Sometimes we have lesions that are too close to the chest wall and we can't get the breast to fall into the hole enough to be visualized and on the detector. In this case, we can put the patient's arm through the hole with the breast and that'll lower the patient's body into the hole and allow more of the breast to be visualized on the detector. <clears throat> Sometimes we have issues that the needle is, is too far from the lesion. And sometimes the lesion can move when we fire it. So sometimes we push the needle out of the, the lesion out of the way when we fire it. Um, and so sometimes what you have to do is position the trough below or above the lesion instead and just sample through those areas. Again, if you ever can't get the positioning correctly, you cancel the biopsy. So sometimes you can't solve these problems that are listed here with the solutions I have, and in which case the biopsy gets canceled and you decide to either excise if the risk of malignancy is high or do a short interval follow-up if you think the risk of malignancy is relatively low. After we do the biopsy, we get a specimen radiograph. And this is to ensure that we have an adequate number of calcifications or we have the lesion sampled. Now with asymmetries and masses done on stereo, it's really hard to confirm in a specimen radiograph, but calcifications are really easy to confirm in a specimen radiograph. So what we do is we x-ray the, the specimens and we make sure that there's an adequate number. If we don't see any calcifications or we don't feel there's enough calcifications, we can always re-biopsy the area. So this is an example of a specimen radiograph, and you can see these cores of tissues in a Petri dish, and we can see some of the calcifications within it. So micromarkers during stereo. So before we place the micromarker, we always wanna look at a, mam a full field mammogram in the breast or place the micromarker to make sure that there are not additional micromarkers in the breast. If there are other micromarkers in the breast from prior biopsies, we wanna make sure we use a different type of micromarker. If you're doing two biopsies at the same time, you wanna make sure you're placing two different micromarkers. Real important thing to remember when placing the micromarker is it stays in the breast and it can be a nidus of infection if it gets contaminated. So you really wanna be very careful to keep the tip of your micromarker introducer covered until you're absolutely ready to place, place the, the micromarker. And you wanna make sure when you go to put the micromarker introducer into the needle, it does not touch anything except the needle. You'd, ideally, you like to place the micromarker in the center of the lesion. And it's important to remember that the micromarker introducer is longer than the biopsy device in some cases. So post-clip mammography after biopsy will confirm placement of the clip. You wanna make sure that the clip corresponds with the original mammographic finding, whether it's um, ultrasound, uh, whether I'm sorry, whether it's a mass or calcifications. And sometimes you can get migration due to accordion effect. When we release the breast out of compression, we can get suction along the 
um, tract of the biopsy and it can move and hopefully there's some residual lesion left um, if this does happen so that we so that we know where the lesion was and we can find it for localization if need be if it's malignant or high risk. So these are some examples of biopsy clips. So here, this is an ultrasound biopsy introducer here, uh, not the stereo one, but a stereo one is, is somewhat similar. But the whole point is that the micromarker is within the needle and there's a plunger, whether it's the ultrasound device plunger or a um, stereo plunger device, which looks a little different, that plunges it out. And there's different shapes. Here's a ribbon, here's a wing, here's a coil. Um, and those little white things are mainly holders for it. And then you can see they're very radio opaque and easy to see. And we joke with our patients that these are like breast jewelry or breast bling. Um, and they're very easy to see and the patient can't feel them. The patient can't see them. Um, a surgeon within the breast can't feel them. And it's important to note that these are made of surgical steel and titanium, which is good because um, very few patients have allergy to them. Most most clips do not contain nickel. I think there might still be one or two out there that do, but you can read the packaging to ensure it doesn't because a lot of people have nickel allergies. Um, but these stay in there and, and they rarely cause the patient's problems. And the nice thing about the surgical steel and titanium is they call it less blooming artifacts than other metals on MRI. So if these patients have to get MRIs, it's not an issue. So let's talk about that clip migration I talked about. So here are the calcifications in this patient in the medial bright breast on the CC that were targeted. After biopsy, we can see the post-biopsy changes in the medial breast, but we also see that the clip migrated, um, migrated medially. And so this can happen. So the important thing to do with this is if you get clip migration, you want to, you want to do pre-magnification views if the patient needs excision of the original lesion and see if there are calcifications remaining so that you can then localize those calcifications and you can leave the clip in. And it's really important to, to document if there's clip migration in your report. So when they go to protocol the biopsy, um, you don't have to, the patient, the clinician protocoling knows, oh, there was clip migration. I need to look for calcifications and not the clip. So now we'll move on to MR guided biopsy. So we're only going to cover a few types of biopsies today because there's two parts to this lecture. Um, but we'll start with this for now. So for MR-guided biopsies, um, we do these for lesions only seen under MRI. So what we'll do is when we do an MRI, we will have a second look ultrasound if we find a lesion. And if we cannot see the lesion under second look ultrasound and the lesion is greater than 2% chance of malignancy, we'll recommend an MR-guided biopsy. So the patients will come in and they'll lay in the MRI. We give them contrast. Uh, we localize the lesion, which we can target manually or via a CAD system. And, and then we biopsy it. And so the first thing I'd like to do is orient everyone with the biopsy kit and the components of it. So this is an obturator and this obturator has some air within the tip that causes blooming artifact. And this goes through the needle so that we can see the blooming artifact where the target should be. We then have a grid and this goes within one of the bigger grid boxes and I'll go back a second. So this is the grid used for compression. So the patient's on their stomach in the coil and we put the grid here, um, either lateral or medial in the breast, depending on where the lesion is. And there's these big grid boxes. And then this is one of those little grids and you put it in the big grid box where the um, needle is gonna go where the lesion is. So that's what that's for. This is, the, this is the needle that helps us get through the skin. And then here we have the sheath for the needle. So the needle goes into the sheath and we, use the needle to get the blunt tip sheath into the skin and to the, to the depth we want, and then we remove the needle and only leave the sheath in, then the obturator goes into that sheath. There's a little black donut, I guess you would call it, um, and we use this to mark the depth. So when you do your calculations on where your lesion is, it's gonna give you a depth, and you want to mark the depth with this, with this black donut so that you don't go into the breast further than the donut and so that you're at the correct depth. This is an image from a MRI corneal biopsy. We can see the patient is lying prone here. We have um, the aorta here, heart, breast that's not being biopsied, and here's the breast in compression. Notice how it has this odd rectangular shape. That's because it's in compression. And we can see the signal void here that is the obturator um, and the biopsy device within the the breast. So once you've completed the biopsy, 
Um, it's the same as a regular biopsy where we, um, a vacuum assisted biopsy is just like a stereo. That's why I kind of do these two together. A stereo is a vacuum assisted biopsy device, usually nine or 10 gauge. It's the same here. It rotates around via suction, takes multiple of these uh, core biopsies. Once you have all of the core biopsies, usually about six to 12, depending on how much you want, then you will um, send them off to pathology. For stereo biopsies as well as emergative biopsies, post biopsy, it's really important to hold pressure, specifically for these two biopsies, even more than an ultrasound guided biopsy because you're using a larger bore needle, which causes more bleeding. MRI biopsies of all the biopsies tend to cause the most bleeding, and that's because the time it takes. So what happens with an MRI biopsy is we put the patient in the, in the, bio, in the MR, we give them contrast, we image it. Then we take them out, we find that we target everything, we then put the needles and the devices into the targeted, then we image again to confirm. Then we take them out. Then we biopsy the area. Then we put them back into confirm placement of the clip. Um, so there's a lot of lag between the biopsy and when pressure is held, and so they tend to get bigger hematomas. So it's really important to really hold pressure at least five to 10 minutes. Sometimes with MR biopsies, we hold up to 15 minutes to decrease the amount of hematoma. Why do you want to decrease hematoma? Well, if there's too large a hematoma, what will happen is it will delay surgery for a breast cancer because it's hard for them to, to do a surgery if there's a large hematoma. In addition, if you use savvy scouts for your pre-surgery localization, hematoma is really the only absolute contraindication to using a savvy scout because it hinders reflection of the signal from the probe um, to be received by the reflector. So you really wanna make sure you minimize the amount of hematoma. Then we usually clean the area off. If there's been a NIC, I know in our institution, we use a NIC for a stereo, but not for a MR biopsy. But if there has been a NIC or if it's a large bore needle, you can use steri strips and then a bandage. We usually give them ice as well to decrease swelling. Our post-procedure instructions include you don't want them to do any heavy lifting or activity for or heavy activity for 24 to 48 hours because what happens there is the breast will move and I always come I always talk about a scab on your knuckle right so if you get a cut on your knuckle and you start bending your finger the scab keeps breaking and it'll bleed and that's what happens if they do things to make the breast move whether it's heavy activity with that arm or heavy lifting it can the scab can break and it will bleed and Patients get very freaked out. I mean, everyone, no one, I don't even like to see myself bleeding at home, right? No one wants to see a wound they have bleed at home. Um, so we always tell them to take light activity to prevent that. For pain, we recommend Tylenol only because um, we don't want acid or NSAIDs because they cause bleeding. Patients who have had, were on chronic aspirin or NSAID therapy, we tell them to stop them um, five days before. Really, that's for aspirin. NSAIDs can be 48 hours before. Um, and then they can restart them within 48 hours. We tell them 20 minutes of ice on and off. We usually tell them to use frozen peas and wrap it in a towel so it's not applied directly to the skin. And this helps with the swelling and discomfort. We tell them to wear a supportive soft bra, usually like a sports bra, um, so that they feel better when they're sleeping and it supports the breast. Shower in the morning, no baths or swimming for five days. They can take the bandage off the next day, but we usually, if they have steri strips, tell them to let them fall off on their own if they haven't um, removed them one week. Another important thing to tell your patient is how long it's going to take for them to get the pathology. For us, it's three to five business days at our site, and they will receive it from the referring clinician. So you want to tell them how long it's going to take for them to receive it. You want to tell them who they're receiving it from. And then we always tell them if they have not heard from their doctor by day five to follow up with their doctor to make sure nothing gets lost in the shuffle of paperwork and now epic inboxes and things like that. We also give them the instructions on when to call your doctor after a biopsy. So we tell them if there's bleeding, fever, you wanna give them a call. If there's any concerning symptoms like um, discharge or drainage from the site or anything like that, we also tell them to call their physician if the pain is getting too severe as well. So one really important part of your post-biopsy um, post -biopsy procedure is to do a pathology addendum. And it's really important to do this because this um, allows us to kind of close the loop on what we're doing. So right, the only reason we do breast imaging is really to find cancer or not cancer. And occasionally we image some infection, but for the most part, things are either benign or malignant. And when they're benign, we really don't care what they are. 
uh, unless it's an infection. And so we really want to make sure that no cancers fall through the cracks. So when you addend your biopsies, you want to addend them with pathologic diagnosis. So my addendum will usually say pathology colon, and then it'll say fibroadenoma if it's benign, or um, invasive ductal carcinoma. And then you will state if this is malignant, high risk, atypical, or benign, because you know we, we specialize in this, and, and so we know this, but there are some primary cares out there that they don't do breast imaging and aren't as familiar. So it's really important for you to make it very clear to them, um, is this something they need to worry about or not? So is it malignant, high risk, or atypical, or benign? And then you need to tell them if it's concordant, right? So you need to state concordant. So I'll usually say, you know, pathology colon, fibroadenoma, period, these findings are benign and concordant because it was an oval circumscribed mass. However, if it comes back fibroadenoma and it was a speculated ugly mass, I would say these findings are not concordant. And then you'll recommend further intervention. If a biopsy is concordant and it's benign, you'll recommend whatever follow-up is needed for them depending on their age with mammography. If it's a malignancy, you will um, tell them they need a surgical consultation. If it's discordant, you will also tell them they need a surgical consultation. Um, and then the most important thing is you want to document who you called. So you want to give them a call and say, um, you know, if it's cancer, um, definitely you want to call and say, you know, patient X, I did her breast biopsy on Thursday and it came out to be invasive ductal carcinoma. So this is malignant and concordant and she's going to need um, a surgical consultation for removal. And then you document who you talk to. Some places also doc um, document all benign results as well and call all of them. So you just need to be familiar with your institution's policies on this, but always document. So let's talk some more about concordance because this is really important. You really wanna make sure your imaging features are consistent with your pathologic diagnosis. If not, you wanna make sure you recommend excision to rule out sampling error. And it's really important that if, if you don't feel it's concordant, to really recommend excision because I, I can tell you, I've had a few where I'm like, eh, I feel really bad making the patient undergo excision and have anesthesia and that's a big deal and it's expensive and there's risk. And I've been so happy I've done it when it's something that I thought was benign, well, that came back as benign, but I thought was a little unsettling, comes back as a cancer and you feel much better. So, so don't, don't hesitate. If you really don't think it's concordant, recommend surgical excision. Also, make sure if calcifications were biopsied that you see calcifications are seen in the pathologic specimen. So really read the pathology report careful. And if it says benign, fibrocystic change, but it says it doesn't say anything about calcifications in the specimen, that's a real problem. And you really want to call your pathologist. So I have a direct line of communication with my pathologist. I know them all by their first name. And that's really important as a breast imager because you really want to help them and they can help you. So if, if it comes back as benign and there are no calcifications, I'd call my pathologist and I'd say, hey, Dina, I say, you know, I just saw that, you know, you said this is benign, but there were no calcifications. And, you know, there definitely were calcifications in my specimen radiograph. Um, maybe we, we need to look at it. So sometimes she'll go back and she'll re-x-ray the specimen and resect it. And if there's still no calcifications, that's a problem. And you have to recommend either excision of those calcifications or re-biopsy. Um, and, and you want to make sure you're very careful about this. Another thing that I think is really important during biopsies is sharp safety. You really want to keep your tray organized and uncluttered. Um, if things are overlapping, you're at more chance for sticking yourself. I've been stuck a few times. It's not fun, um, especially if the patient doesn't consent to having their blood drawn or there's some other compounding thing why they can't, and then you have months and months of blood follow-up blood tests. So um, you really want to make sure everything's very organized. You don't want things overlapping. You want everything, you know, visible. Um, I always have all my sharps facing away from me in one direction. Um, if possible, use a pad in which you can stick used needles in. I also always tell my residents to clean up your own sharps. It is not any type of technologist or uh, technologist aide's job to clean your sharps up. You know, you put them down and you know where you put them down and you're less likely to stick yourself because you know where everything is. So I always tell my residents to clean their own sharps up. I try to clean my own sharps up all the time as well. So now that we've kind of talked about biopsies and some biopsy important things, I thought we'd go on to some needle localizations um, if we have time. I think we probably have a few minutes um, to do this. This talk tends to run about a full hour. So 
I didn't realize we had question to answer, but uh, right now there's only one question. So, so let's try to get through a little of needle localization. So we talked about this having been the original way that people did biopsies way back when before percutaneous guidance. Um, and there's multiple ways to do localizations now. The most traditional way, which we'll start talking about is a wire localization. Um, and this is how it used to be done. Now there's all types of um, reflectors, like I said, with Scabby Scouts. Scabby Scouts, there's um, magnetic ways to do this. There's uh, radionucleotide ways to do it. Um, but we'll start with just traditional needle localizations um, for now. So a wire is placed in the lesion of interest and the wire has a thickening on it. And that allows the surgeon, if the thickening is centered in the lesion, to feel to make non-palpable lesions palpable. It can be done under any type of imaging guidance at, at MAMO, ultrasound, or MRI. And normally you use a modified Copan's wire or a Hawkins wire, the most common. And as I said, it has a stiffener and it makes non-palpable lesions palpable. So what comes in the kit is a hollow bore 20 gauge needle along with a wire with some kind of hook and stiffener on it. And the wires, the needles come in different lengths with corresponding wires. So this, these are actually the needle lengths which is three centimeters, five centimeters, seven and a half centimeters, and 10 centimeters. And the reason we have different lengths is, you know, even though you're trying to get the shortest length from the skin, sometimes that shortest length can be up to 10 centimeters. And then there are wires that correspond to each of these needles that come with the kit. So this is a traditional needle localization wire. It's a hollow bore 20 gauge needle. And we have a a uh, sorry, wire. This is a, I think this is a, modif a modified Copan's wire. And there's a hatch mark on it. And you can see the stiffener here and you can see the hook. The hook helps keep this in place so it doesn't slide back out. And as I said, the stiffener will allow a non palpable lesion to become palpable. There is a hash mark. There's a single and a dual hatch mark. The dual hatch marks up here. But we usually bury the wire into the needle once the needle is in place um, to this hatch mark. We usually place the needle 1.5 centimeters past the lesion. And by doing that, when we bury the wire to this hatch mark and we unsheath the wire, allowing for the hook to bring back out, using the Seldinger technique, we remove the needle. And what happens is the wire, if it's 1.5 centimeters past the tip of the needle here, will be centered because the tip from the hook to the center of the stiffener is 1.5 centimeters. It should be centered in the lesion, making a non-palpable lesion palpable. So what are the indications for needle localization? Uh, as we know, they used to be done for surgical biopsy, which we still do, but usually now we use it for lumpectomy for proven uh, high-risk or cancerous lesions, but you can do it for primary uh, surgical biopsy. Um, and we can do localization for lesions not amenable to percutaneous biopsy for excision. Now with upright stereotactic biopsies, MRI biopsies and all these things like that, it's very rare to find something that's not amenable to percutaneous biopsy, but if it exists, we can use neo localization for that. Again, just like with a stereotactic biopsy, you wanna use it the shortest distance from the skin, but you also have to make sure you can see it in MAMO, we can look from superior and inferior in the, in the CC view. We can do medial or lateral in the true lateral view. On ultrasound and MR, though, we only go medial and lateral due to the image way we image. Um, so you can only come from medial or lateral. Again, for MAMO localizations, if we can't see the lesion, we localize the micromarker if we know it's in the right spot. Um, we can also localize masses under ultrasound or calcifications under MAMO. The patient's usually sitting unless we have to go from below, in which case they're standing in the MAMO machine, and we have them in compression for the entire procedure. You can perform single wire or a two wire bracket for larger lesions or spans of calcification. So I'll show you an example um, of a needle localization, and then we'll probably stop here so that we can answer some questions. As I said, this is a two-part talk. I go into ultrasound-guided um, biopsies and FNAs, as well as other other localization techniques in a second talk. Um, so here you can see we use an alphanumeric grid to localize the lesion. So we target here, we put a little crosshair here and it would be seven and F. Then using the, there's a light that allows us to see the crosshairs on the breast at the time and we put the needle so that the hub is directly over the crosshairs and we, and we put it into the breast. Once it's in the breast, we go to an orthogonal view. This is the orthogonal view. And then we control the depth of the needle. And you always want to pull back and never push in. 
because then you don't know if you're in the right plane anymore. So what you want to do is you want to measure from the tip of the needle to the center of the lesion, and you know you need to be 1.5 centimeters past the lesion. If you're not, then you just pull back accordingly. There's little hash marks on the needle. You pull back accordingly until you're there. Once you're at 1.5 centimeters past the center of the lesion, you put the wire in. You bury it to that first hatch mark I showed you on that prior image. And then using Seldinger, you keep the wire still in place and you pull the needle off. When you take the needle off, you should see the stiffener right here buried in the lesion and the hook should be just outside the lesion. I think the next slide is a specimen radiograph, yes. So then you take two films for the um, surgeon. We mark the nipple and we mark the um, entrance of the needle with a BB. And then we send those images to the surgeon so they can use it like a roadmap. And once they've excised it, they will send us a specimen. And the specimen usually contains the wire and the target. In this case, we would tell them, they'll usually call us while the patient's still in open and in the OR and we'll say, well, the wire and the clip are here. However, the clip is along whatever, they'll usually label it either with uh, ink or with sutures, short and long sutures. But in this case, you say, oh, you know, let's say this is the medial margin via the ink color. I'll say, you know, the clip is really close to the medial margin. You might want to go in and re-excise. And that's why it's so important to do it with the, um, with the patient still open in the operating room. So that's how a traditional needle localization is. And since, you know, we have limited time, um, this is a bracket I'll show you just quickly. Uh, so you see, so a bracket is kind of like putting parentheses around something. The most common type, time we use it is for spans of calcification. And it's just two needle localizations done at the same time. And instead of being right in the middle of the target, you want to be just on either side of the target. Again, like parentheses, so you make sure everything's contained between the two. And then you'll get a specimen with two wires and two needles. So let's see what questions we have uh, in the last few minutes. Elastography is all right. So I have one question so far, and it is elastography useful to reduce sampling error in breast biopsy, i.e., rule out necrotic tissue or select a malignant focus? Um, I'm at an institution that does not use elastography, and so I don't have much experience with elastography and biopsy. Um, so I'm not really able to answer this question well. But you know what we do recommend always is to target different parts of the lesion. So if you know, what I know about elastography, like you said here, is it can show more higher risk areas, you know, if it's necrotic, which you probably don't want to biopsy necrotic tissue, right? Or if there's an area that's more likely to be malignant based on the elastography features, you can target that better. Um, so, so in theory, from, from knowing the basics of elastography, it, it should help a little. However, you still want to always biopsy all parts of a lesion. I think that, um, I think that would be the smartest thing even with elastography. And by, so like I try to biopsy the superior part, the inferior part, the medial part, you just try to biopsy different sections. And again, try to avoid anything necrotic because you won't get as good yield out of that. Perfect, that's the only question I see. I don't know if you have any words yeah. of wisdom or anything else, or if you have a few more slides you wanna get through, we do still have a few minutes left. Um, let me see. Yeah, since we do, I just was nervous. I didn't know how many questions we'd have. Um, we can talk about ultrasound loads then for a bit. Um, so again, ultrasound localization is very similar to mammographic localization in that we use the same, the same tool for a while localization, the same um, needle and wire system. However, with ultrasound, we're using ultrasound, clearly. <laughs> um, and usually we do things that are only visible under ultrasound like solid masses. So you would not localize calcifications under ultrasound. Um, what are the pros of this? Ultrasound is much more comfortable for the patient. Um, they're lying on their back with their arm behind their head. There's no compression. Um, they're usually much happier about that. Um, but, you know, we do have to still be careful with this, take a little more skill on the radiologist part with hand-eye coordination with the probe and the needle and making sure we don't violate the chest wall. And this is just an image of an ultrasound localization. So, again, this is that 20-gauge needle coming toward the oval hypochoic mass. It'll pass through it here. Then I measure tip to center of the lesion to make sure I'm 1.5 centimeters through the lesion. Then I'll deploy the wire. And then this is an image of the wire with its hook with the stiffener in the middle of the lesion. And again, you'll get that same specimen radiograph just like the mammogram. Here it is. So we usually will take a post mammogram as well, uh, even if it's an ultrasound loop to show the stiffeners right at the clip. And then you'll get your, your specimen like you do for the um, mammographic localization. MR, 
we still have two minutes. These are rarely done. Um, they're done for lesions that are not accessible for percutaneous MR biopsy guidance um, and are only seen on MRI. As I said, we don't do them very often. You have to make sure the needle wire system, which looks the same as your one for MAMO and ultrasound, um, is compatible with MRI. Um, if they have not been able to biopsy the lesion prior to localization, you want to make sure you put a clip at the site right before you deploy your wire, which helps for confirmation in the specimen. Let's see, I see we have another question, so let me see. Here's an example of an MR localization. It looks very similar to the biopsy. This is the tip of the needle in the lesion, the signal void, not very pretty images. Okay, this is ductography, so we'll stop here, um, and let's see. Do you do, so I have questions here. I have, do you use stereotactic device for hook wire? So no, so, so you, you use a regular MAMO. You wouldn't use the stereotactic biopsy table for a localization. Normally you use a regular mammogram device. The difference is you'll use a alphanumeric grid paddle with an opening versus a solid paddle. So no, you don't use the actual stereotactic biopsy machine to do the um, biopsy is to do the uh, wire load placement. And then do you do axillary, uh, axillary lymph nodes? I'm not sure what this is referring to. We can FNA axillary lymph nodes, and yes, you can localize them. So sometimes we have patients who have large, ah, uh, yes, do you do wire localizations? Yes, yes, yes. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so for, for some patients who have had a positive lymph node, we will clip those at the time of FNA. And then we can wire, we can use a wire to localize them um, for surgeons who desire that. Not all of our surgeons like us to do that, but some do. So yes, you can do it. You usually, you clearly do it under ultrasound gui guidance. Um, and uh, it's, it's difficult though. I will say it's not easy. And I usually, if we're going to place a clip in a lymph node, I usually do a coil clip because those are the easiest to see under ultrasound. Uh, the next question is, do you do sentinel node biopsies. So what we do is we do do FNA of, of axillary lymph nodes if they're enlarged. So, so it's, it's, I wouldn't necessarily, so I guess you could call it a sentinel node. So sentinel node really refers to the, drain, the draining node, the first draining node of the breast that drains the majority of the breast. And really when we're doing imaging, we really can't tell which node that is. Usually you have to use blue dye or uh, radionucleotide um, during surgery to do that. But what we do do is if we see an enlarged lymph node, we, we FNA it. Um, and that way we know if there are positive nodes up front. Sometimes that's the sentinel node. Sometimes it's actually not the sentinel node. Um, so, so that's a little bit of a complicated question. But we FNA using a 21 gauge needle, just like I said, we do FNAs um, in the first part of the, um, uh, the talk. Um, and so someone also asked, what is the role of FNA in today's patients with breast cancer? Uh, it's surgeon dependent. Um, so you have to ask, talk to your breast surgeons. And most of the things, you know, so one of the things I absolutely love about breast imaging is the collaboration with the surgeons. Um, so we talk to our surgeons and what they like us to do is if we see a positive axillary lymph node, they like us to FNA it. Um, and that allows us them to know ahead of time if there's axillary disease um, sometimes they'll have us FNA more than one, two, because that helps with the Z11 um, criteria as well. So we do do it, but again, um, it's something you like to collaborate with your surgeons about to see what they need to make what they do um, more efficient. Should FNA be a step prior in every breast biopsy? No, no. So if, if, if you can core a breast lesion, you should just core a breast lesion. Uh, you should always do a core biopsy. It's the best for the pathology. Uh, it's the best way to get all the receptors, all the information about the tumor. And it's the best way to decrease the time from diagnosis to surgery. And that's the goal, right? So if you do an FNA, you're going to need a core biopsy anyway, most likely if it's malignant. And so you're going to want to do a core right up front. So no, I would not recommend fna lesions before core. If there's some kind of weird thing with a patient where it can't be cored or something like that, then you can FNA it up front to see if it's malignant or benign. But then if it's malignant, most, most surgeons and pathologists are gonna to wanna to core. So it's just smart to do the core up front if it's feasible. Looks like yep. that's it for questions. Yep, I was about to say the same thing. Uh, so as we bring this to a close, I just wanna say thank you, Dr. DiBenedictus for your time today. We really appreciate you joining us.
And thanks to all of you for participating in this noon conference. A reminder that it will be made available on demand at mrionline.com. In addition to all previous noon conferences, these are made available complimentary. And tomorrow, join us for a noon conference with Dr. Mark Goslin on thromboembolic disease challenging the conventional wisdoms and algorithms. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.